Father, you are holy and good and righteous and just and sovereign and all-knowing. And we thank you for your electing love in which you chose to save some of us from among the masses of humanity deserving of your wrath. You chose some of us to show mercy and to show your love by choosing us. And we thank you, Christ, for dying in our place for taking the wrath of God that we deserved. We thank you for taking the punishment that we deserved, for standing in our place as a worthy substitute. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for applying that redemption to us, for drawing our hearts, for regenerating us and washing our hearts that we would choose Christ and be saved. And I pray today, as we look into this text, that we would be reminded of the grandeur of God of who you are and how much bigger you are than our circumstances in this world and be reminded of the fact that this entire world belongs to you and must give an account to you. And we thank you that you are the righteous judge who rules over all creation. And I ask now as we go to your word that you would open our hearts, open our minds, that we could understand it and apply it to our lives. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If there is no God, there is no justice. This is an argument that's been put forth by Christian apologists for years, basically meaning that if there is no God in heaven, there is no moral standard to which all men are accountable. You know, otherwise all our morals are relative. You might do what you think is right and I can do what I think is right. But if there is a God in heaven, he sets the standard for what's right and wrong. And aside from that, only a final cosmic judge can really give us justice. Because we do have justice in this earth, right? We have our own courts and our own systems that God's given us, but they're imperfect, right? They don't always work the way they should. Think, for instance, of someone like Jeffrey Epstein. He lived his whole life committing some of the worst crimes in history. And at the same time, he lived a life of luxury. He, he enjoyed all the pleasures of this world while at the same time being a heinous criminal. And at the end of his life, he gets caught, he goes to jail for a few days, and then he dies. So he never really paid for any of his crimes. In that sense, if there is no God that he has to answer to, he got away with it. You could say the same of someone like Kim Jong-il, the predecessor of Kim Jong-un in North Korea, who oppressed his own people, starved his own people, imprisoned his own people. And when he died, they made a statue out of him. He never paid for any of those crimes. And that's why we as Christians can say, if there is no God to which all men must answer for all of their actions, there is no justice. And what I'm trying to say is that we desire justice. We want to see justice, but we can't really make it happen perfectly here on earth. And so I want to share with you today what Scripture has to say about perfect, final justice. And we're going to learn about that from Revelation chapter 20. I thank the brother for reading the chapter. The context will be helpful, but we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11. Revelation 20, beginning in verse 11, and we're going to read through verse 15. John records, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence heaven and earth fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
So this is what I'm calling final justice. And to see this whole picture, we're going to look at three things in this text. We're going to look at the final judge, the final courtroom, and the final verdict. So to begin with, the final judge, we read about that in verse 11, where John records, I saw two things. He says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. This is the description we have of the judge. So the great white throne, it's called great, meaning big, magnificent. It has grandeur to it. It has weight to it. But a throne is not big for its own sake. The description of a throne is not for, to describe the chair. It's to describe the person who sits in the chair. I don't know if you remember when this most recent pope in the Roman Catholic Church was chosen, he threw away the old big ornate chair and got a big wooden chair to sit in because he wanted to show how humble he is. Right? The chair points to the person, and he's not humble, by the way, but the chair points to the person who sits in it. So, you know, this is why it's shown as big and great. It's pointing to the significance of whoever sits in that chair is very important. That's why John includes that detail. But then he includes that it's a white throne. Every word of Scripture is inspired. Amen? So why does John include these little details and descriptions of the throne that the judge sits in? Well, it's big to show his significance, and it's white to show his moral purity. That who, whatever judge it is that sits in this chair, he judges with absolute moral purity and clarity, and his judgments are perfect. So this is the judge we're dealing with. He is extremely significant. You know, one person pointed out, in this scene here, we have multitudes, innumerable multitudes of people, and John's first comment is to look past all of them to the throne. So how great must it have been to rise above all these crowds that that's the first thing his eyes were drawn to? So whoever sits in this throne, whoever the final judge is, he is extremely significant, and we know that his judgments are going to be perfect. So that's the throne, and then John says, I also saw the one sitting in the throne. At this point, you've probably assumed from context that it is God who sits in the throne, and you would be right. Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8 says, The Lord abides forever. He establishes his throne for judgment, and he will execute judgment with righteousness for all peoples with equity. This is God. This is a picture that we get of God throughout Scripture as sitting in his throne in heaven, owning the world and ready to judge the world. But more specifically, it's God the Son. We believe in the Trinity, three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, one essence, God sitting in the throne is God the Son, and we know that for a few reasons. That's who's being emphasized here. Number one, because the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's the main theme of the book. He's the main character of the book. So we see Christ as judge in the book, just in the context, but also we learn this explicitly elsewhere in Scripture. In John 5, 22, Jesus said, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. And then in Acts 17, 31, Paul says, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man who he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So throughout the New Testament especially, it becomes more and more clear that the one who's going to give the final judgments is Christ. And we know that he became man. He is truly God, truly man, 100% of both. And that's why he's able to sit on the throne and be seen there judging everyone. So the throne is great. It represents purity. The one who sits on it is God the Son, the man, Christ Jesus, will rule over everything. And then it gives us another description here. To describe the one sitting on the throne, it says, he's the one from whom heaven and earth fled away then no place was found for them. And this is an extremely interesting passage for this reason. What's being described there when heaven and earth fled away is that they're uncreated. They're destroyed. A pastor at my church calls this uncreation. And we, we learn about this in 2 Peter 3. Peter wrote, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. The heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. 
So what we have right here, verse 11, is literally the end of the world. This is when, just as in Genesis 1, God created the earth in six days out of nothing. Here, he's sending it back into nothing. He's getting rid of it, destroying it finally at the end. And why does he do that? Why does creation itself have to be destroyed? Because it's corrupted with sin. That's why we have earthquakes and wildfires and tsunamis and diseases. Because sin has permeated all of creation. Like Milton said, when Adam bit into the fruit, it is as if the entire universe let out a groan. All of creation has been permeated and corrupted by sin. And what we're seeing here is God is dealing with sin everywhere it exists. Right before this, in verse 10, we see Satan thrown into the lake of fire, right? So he deals with this instance of sin and Satan, and then he destroys creation, and he burns that away. So he deals with that instance of sin, and then he turns to the last instance of sin, which is sinful humanity. These are the only verses in the Bible, interestingly, where no earth exists. In chapter 21, verse 1, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So right before this passage, the earth is destroyed, there's nothing, and then the new earth comes afterwards. So somehow, I don't know, it doesn't tell us, somehow this is a cosmic courtroom where there is nothing except God on his throne and sinful humanity. That's it. That's all that is standing here at this point. And so the final judge turns to the final courtroom to deal out his verdict. And what we're going to see of the final courtroom here is that the people being judged can't hide anything from this judge. No matter what they do, everything they've said, thought, or done is recorded without error. So let's look at that in verses 12 and 13. John says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. So we learn two things in these verses, at least two things. One, we see who is being judged, and secondly, we see how they are judged or by what standard they are judged. So first, who is it that's on trial here? Who is it that's standing before God? Well, we're told it's the dead, that everyone has been resurrected. Elsewhere in Scripture, this is called the resurrection unto judgment. And you'll see in, in the statement of faith at the church here, under the heading of resurrection, it talks about the two resurrections, some resurrected to life and others unto judgment. And that's what we're dealing with here. Without getting into too much detail, believers have already stood before God at this point. All that's left are unbelievers. And so what we have here is all the multiplied masses of unbelievers from all of history, from Cain all the way up to the present day, everyone who has not been saved by putting their faith in Christ is now standing before God. The dead have been brought to life for judgment. And it says the great and small. That's a way of saying everyone. That's another way of saying everyone. It's talking about the little people and the big people, right? I used to push carts at Ralph's. So this is like saying the cart pusher and the CEO. Everyone in between, they're all there before God, and none of them have you know, a step up on anyone else. They're all standing before the same God to be judged by the same standard. So that's who it is. All the unbelievers throughout all of history. But how are they judged? What standard at the end of time will all people be judged by? We know that it's God's law, but what is it that's brought out in the court? It says twice here, once in verse 12 and once in verse 13, they were judged according to their deeds. They were judged according to every action they'd ever done, every thought, every word that has transgressed God's law is now being brought out in full detail. Romans 2, 6 Paul says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness of the judgment of God, who will render to each person according to their deeds. So Paul says what we're seeing played out here in this courtroom setting, that every sin, every, every breaking of God's law is being stored up until this day when it will all be brought out. 
and the books were opened. And what are these books? What's recorded in these books? Well, we see a very similar court scene. It could be the exact same one, although this older court scene in Scripture is talking about a specific audience that will be judged. But back in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, we see a very similar court scene where Daniel records, I kept looking up until the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, his hair was like pure wool, his throne was ablaze with flames, and its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him, and thousands upon thousands were attending him, that's probably angels, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Whatever is recorded in these books is used as evidence against those who are on trial. And that's why I say every word, every thought, every deed will be brought into light at this point. We know that people will give account for the words that they speak. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus tells us that every careless word you speak will be given an account for on the day of judgment. Average speaking, people say about 15,000 to 16,000 words a day. And every single one of them will be brought out in the books on the Day of Judgment. And every single word that does not glorify God will be stored up for wrath against those who are not in Christ. But it gets worse. Every thought will be stored up. Not just the ones that come out of your heart into your mouth and come out, but every thought Romans 2.16 says God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So once again, we see through Jesus Christ on the throne, but not just the words being written down, the thoughts being written down. People get concerned about their data being leaked, about your search histories and your private emails and text messages being read by someone, but these books contain all of those and every thought that didn't even make it out. This is the kind of courtroom we're dealing with. And then, of course, I don't even need to say the actions, the actual actions that are sinful are brought out as well. In some courtrooms, someone said, evidence is brought forward forward to inform the judge. But in this courtroom, evidence is brought forward to inform the condemned. God knows it all. And now they're all going to stand, all sinful humanity. And as it says in Romans 3.19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and the whole world be held accountable to God. Every thought, every word, every action will be brought forward to the condemned to show them why they are about to receive their judgment. I remember going to a birthday party in junior high It was a perfect birthday party for 10 and 11-year-old boys. We were going to eat and then play laser tag. That was the whole day. That was all we had planned. And so in the eating portion, we had hot dogs, hamburgers, typical birthday stuff. And I like mustard, so I got a hot dog. I loaded it up with mustard, and I took a bite. And as I took the bite, a big glob came out and just splattered on my jeans. And so being a 10 or 11 year old boy, I grabbed a napkin and I scraped it off as hard as I could. And after I got a little bit off, at that point, I wasn't trying to get the mustard out of the pants. I was trying to make the the mustard and the pants become one. I was just rubbing it in, trying to hope I could disguise it by getting it to blend into the colors around it. So maybe people wouldn't notice the stain if I could just smear it in enough so that it would blend in with the pants. And I did a pretty good job. You couldn't really notice it unless you were looking for it. You know, you have those stains on some things that, unless you're looking right at it, you might be able to look past it. But then we went to play laser tag. And if you've ever done that, you know that those rooms are typically lit by black lights. Not by normal lights like this that shine light. Black lights just make bright colors glow. So like my shirt would be glowing right now and you wouldn't be able to see my jacket very much. So we go in to play laser tag, and this stain that I thought I had dealt with just comes shining like a light bulb. Shines brighter than the rest of my pants because it's yellow and fluorescent. And this thing that I thought I had dealt with now is shining. Now comes out clearly. 
And you may think that you've dealt with sin in your life by pushing it into the background and by moving past it and by forgetting about it and by moving on to something else. But on this day, all sin is going to shine. It's going to be illuminated clearly. And that's why Jesus said in Luke 12, 3, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light and whatever you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. So I don't doubt that on this day there's going to be many people that think they've dealt with sin, that think they've faded it into the background of their life and they've faded the stain of sin enough that they can slip by. But on this day, it's all going to be brought to light. This is the final courtroom where everything is brought out one final time. So we've seen the final judge, we've seen the final courtroom, and now we're going to turn to the final verdict. And what we learn about this verdict is that it is not only final, meaning the last one, but it lasts forever. It's an eternal verdict. And we read about that in verses 14 and 15. Verse 14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now you may notice three times repeated in these two verses is the phrase, the lake of fire. And we saw it back in verse 10 as well. That's where the devil gets thrown and his accomplices, they're thrown into the lake of fire. And so we learn three things about the lake of fire here. First, that death itself goes into the lake of fire. Did you know that death itself gets thrown out in the end? This is where it goes, apparently. Death is thrown into the lake of fire to be no more. There's no more death after this point. That's the end of death. It's judged finally forever, and it will never come into the new heaven and new earth because God deals with it right here. But secondly, the lake of fire is called the second death. And by that, what John means here is that everyone dies once. We all die physically. But to those who die in Christ, we are raised unto eternal life, life with him. But those who die in their sins are raised to die eternally in the lake of fire. That's why it's called the second death, because people die twice when they go here. And then thirdly, we see that all of these people who have been judged for all of their words, thoughts, and actions that they've ever done are locked in this place forever. This is a very unpleasant idea, an extremely unpleasant idea. But we need to know what Scripture says. And I'm going to try to give some reasons for why we need to look at the doctrine of hell seriously. And we need to square with what Scripture says about it. And we need to see the results of doing that. So number one, we need to look at what is the lake of fire? What is it that's going on here? And I want to tell you two things about it that are very, very terrifying things. One, it's painful. We see just in verse 10, when, when the devil is thrown in, verse 10 reads, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever. Back in chapter 14, Verse 11, John recorded, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Without trying to speculate or to go into detail, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but Scripture is abundantly clear that hell is a torturous, terrifying place. It's an extremely uncomfortable place with no relenting day and night. So that's number one, the lake of fire is painful. Secondly, the lake of fire is forever Christians sometimes try to rationalize it and say, well, maybe it's a temporary punishment. Or maybe, just like God, remember, the earth just went out of existence. Maybe that's what God does with people. After he judges them, maybe he just snaps them out of existence instead of sending them into eternal torment. But as we see in the verses we've already read, it speaks of forever and ever. But then in Matthew 25, 46, there's a very clear verse on this that uh, kind of deals with all the arguments of those who want to say hell is temporary or that people just go out of existence. And that verse says, this is Jesus speaking of a, of a judgment, he says, the wicked will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And he uses that word eternal on both ends, eternal punishment and eternal life. 
So you really have to do some interpretive gymnastics to say eternal means eternal life, but over here it doesn't really mean eternal death. It doesn't really mean eternal torment. So one verse, same word, used twice in the exact same way, we can know without a doubt that it means the same thing in both circumstances. So the lake of fire is painful and it is forever. As Christians, we think about the eternity of eternal life, right? And that's something that brings us joy. We sing when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Well, likewise, those who end up in the lake of fire could sing when we've been there 10,000 years, enduring the wrath of God. They will be not one more second closer to escape than the day they got there. The eternity that brings us hope, that gives us joy, that we look forward to, is the exact same eternity that those who end up in the lake of fire will endure under the wrath of God forever. I'd like to read a, a longer quote from a pastor for you. And again, we'll look at reasons why we must study hell, why we must take this seriously. I don't enjoy talking about it. I don't enjoy thinking about it, to be honest with you. But this is what the Bible teaches. I want to read a longer quote for you, describing the torments of hell. This is from a preacher trying to warn his people and his congregation about the torments of hell. He said, Though you are alone in darkness in the lake of fire, you will nonetheless hear the hopeless wailing of the damned. With your eyes, which on earth looked at pornography or read blasphemous books denying Christ, you will look on untold, unimaginable horror. And with your ears, which took in perverse, godless, licentious ideas, you will now hear the cries of the condemned. They beg for mercy, but there is none forthcoming. With your mouth, which uttered blasphemous, vile, crude, demeaning speech, you will curse God and his servants with a loud voice of contempt, hatred, and sorrow. And with your hands, which engaged in all manner of creative sinning, they will now reach up to heaven begging for a touch from God whom you rejected, and there will be no reciprocation from the Holy One. Your feet, which were swift to run to the shedding of innocent blood and to take place in the sensual delight and debauchery of this life, will then seek to run for refuge, but they will be like feet stuck in cement. There is no deliverance from judgment. There is no hope. You are lost in a most dreadful judgment. There is no mercy in the lake of fire. And then he concludes, he says, do you think this is over the top? Do you think I'm overdoing this? My friend, I am so completely limited in my ability to communicate to you the horrors of hell and of the lake of fire. It is infinitely worse than I could portray to you. Physical pain aside, as a believer, I'm sure you've sinned and you feel guilt for the sin. You feel that, have you ever been overwhelmed with guilt for a sin you've committed? Or maybe remembered something from before you were a believer, and then you start to feel guilty and shame again from that sin. And as believers, what do we do in those moments? We run to Christ. And we're thankful again, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. We go back to that moment and say, the grace is still precious in this guilt and in this shame. But for those in the lake of fire, there is no relief from the guilt of sin. There's no relief from the shame of sin. The lake of fire is a horrible, terrible place. But it's what Scripture teaches and it actually teaches us that God is good. I was disappointed when I was reading and studying for this. I was reading a book by a man who I do respect, I appreciate. He's a conservative Christian scholar, excellent on things like the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture. But in this book, he said, if I could create my own religion, I would not have eternal punishment in it. Now, that may seem compassionate, right? We all have that kind of nudge to say, well, maybe he doesn't need to do that. But as one man pointed out, when we think this way, we're really saying that I am more merciful than God. I'm more kind and more loving than he is. But how can I possibly be more gracious than he is who sent his only son to endure the agonies of hell in the place of sinners? Surely I am less holy, less just, less righteous than he is. There is something very right about those who rejected the mercy of God landing in hell. 
And that's the truth. We, we have this natural impulse to, to shy away from it. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to bring it up with people. So we think maybe we could have done it better than God. Are we more merciful than God, more wise than God, more just than God? Do we love righteousness more than God? Of course not. But there are good reasons for us to study the doctrine of hell, as much as we don't like it, as much as we squirm and try to get away from it. And I want to look at some of those reasons. First of all, as I'm sure all of you in this room would agree, it's in God's Word. God's Word is good and authoritative and true, so we must believe it. We don't have the option to just cut that part out of our Bibles. But secondly, even Jesus himself spoke about hell more than anyone else in the New Testament. In Matthew, he calls it the furnace of fire, and in Mark 9, he calls it unquenchable fire. And Jesus spoke about these things. So, you know, we can't be rid of hell thinking that we're better than God, that we're more merciful than God. We can't avoid talking about hell as if we're better evangelists than Jesus, as if we're better preachers than Jesus himself. But then there are benefits that we derive from studying something as terrible and as horrible as the lake of fire. First of all, it teaches the seriousness of sin. When we look at hell, we look at eternal punishment, our first inclination is to think, that seems like a bit much. But we need to reverse it because we know God's judgments are good. Whatever judgment he gave to sin, it's deserving of. So instead, when we look at internal punishment, we should say, wow, sin is much worse than I thought it was. Sin is much more serious than I perceived it to be because God judges it that way and his judgment is perfect. So it teaches the seriousness of sin. Secondly, it glorifies God. The existence of the lake of fire glorifies God. Remember, the reason anything exists at all is to glorify God. And the same is true for the lake of fire. Romans 9 speaks to this very clearly. Romans 9 verses 21 through 23 says, Does not the potter, that's God, have right over the clay, that's humanity, to make from the same lump of clay one vessel for honorable use and one for common use? And then Paul says, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So those who end up receiving God's judgment demonstrate his wrath, demonstrate his power, demonstrate his justice. Just as we who are saved, we are saved to demonstrate his mercy. Ephesians 2, 7 says we are saved so that in eternity we can, God can tell forth the praises of his own mercy. We are saved to, be, to demonstrate his mercy and his love and his kindness. Just as all those who receive judgment, that happens to display God's justice and God's righteousness and God's truth. So hell teaches us the seriousness of sin. It glorifies God. And it doesn't contradict his mercy or his love. It doesn't contradict his kindness. Sinclair Ferguson said, Preachers tend to emotion, be emotionally wired towards one emphasis or the other, either towards favoring the love of Christ but diluting it by minimizing the reality of hell. And sometimes they make the same mistake by thinking that true biblical balance is found somewhere in the middle, that we can either have Christ's love or his judgment. Because remember, Christ is on the throne at this point. So it's his judgment or his love. But the point Ferguson makes here so clearly is that it's not a balance as if these two things contradict each other, but we need to affirm both of them fully, 100%. So it glorifies God, it teaches us the seriousness of sin, and it deals with the problem of evil. You remember how we started talking about if there is no God, there is no justice? You may have heard this brought up to you before by unbelievers, but there's a common thing that they'll say as if the problem of evil is this silver bullet that's going to sink Christianity. Where they say, God is all-powerful, God is all-good, evil exists. So if evil exists, either God is not powerful enough to overcome it, or he's not good enough to overcome it. And so they say, gotcha, I disproved God. And there are good answers to those questions. Those are questions that we ourselves should ask, and Scripture speaks to those things sufficiently. But after you've done that with the unbeliever when this comes up, flip the question back on them and say, okay, you've heard my answer for where evil came from, but we both agree evil is here and justice is here. What does your view of the world, how does your view of the world deal with that? It doesn't. 
Whereas we can say, yes, there's evil, yes, there's injustice, but there's an answer for it on the day of judgment before God. So we agree that evil exists, but scripture gives us a way to deal with that, whereas the atheistic worldview has no way of dealing with it. So it shows us justice. It shows us cosmic justice as an answer to the problem of evil. And then one final reason that we should look squarely at this doctrine and deal with it as it is, not avoid it, is that it propels us to preach the gospel. It propels us to warn people of the wrath to come. Now, hell doesn't have to come up in every conversation you have with an unbeliever. I think that would be inappropriate. But does it ever come up? Have you ever warned someone about the justice of God and the wrath to come? Our descriptions of God's wrath should be so vivid, so real, and so accurate to those unbelievers that we love that if they do end up seeing it, they'll recognize it when they get there. They'll say, oh, this is why he was pleading with me. This is why she kept bringing that up to me, to warn me about this. John MacArthur said, There is an eternal hell and there is an eternal heaven, and everyone on the face of the earth will either spend their eternity in heaven or in hell. And when we realize that, we are compelled. No one, no one with a reasonable understanding of heaven's glories and a reasonable understanding of hell's horror could ever be mediocre in the ministry unless they had a very cold heart. If you ever find yourself stagnant towards evangelism, if you ever find yourself growing stale when it comes to preaching the gospel to people, look clearly and take a long look at the lake of fire. That will stir up your affections to warn those that you know are headed there. This should propel us to warn those that we know are going to see the wrath of God. So hell teaches us the seriousness of sin. It glorifies God. It deals with all the injustices in the world. They will all be made right because of the lake of fire. And it compels us to preach the gospel to share the gospel. And one final point, one reason why we as believers particularly should look at the lake of fire, the doctrine of hell, is that it makes Christ's sacrifice that much more precious. I quoted it already, how precious did that grace appear the hour we first believed, that first moment when I knew I was damned, but I recognized there was a worthy substitute in Christ that God had made a way for me to be saved, how precious was grace in that moment when you first knew that God saved you from the wrath that you deserved. When we study God's wrath in Scripture, it should bring us back to that moment, the preciousness of grace, that this is the judgment I deserved, that you deserved. So as believers, when we read these things, we shouldn't only be uncomfortable about it. We shouldn't only let it drive us to evangelize. We shouldn't only see it as cosmic justice. We should see it as God's mercy and keeping us from that and saving us from what we deserved. So we've seen the final judge. We've seen the final courtroom. We've seen the final verdict. But God's justice doesn't end there. This has been what you could call retributive justice. This is retribution for the wrongdoings. But God's justice goes even further than that. I remember hearing a, a famous Baptist minister say once that if a drunk driver, say, in this world, swerves off the road and paralyzes a young girl, the best justice that this world has to offer is to put that man in jail. That's all we can do. Only God's justice can guarantee that she will walk again. Only God's justice can not only punish the crimes, can punish the wickedness, but can undo the effects of it, can undo the effects of sin. And that's what we see in the new heaven and the new earth. Read with me in chapter 21. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. I saw a holy city. New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, 
and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. There is injustice in this world. And unless God judges the evildoers and undoes the effects of sin, creating a new heaven and a new earth where we can dwell with him forever, there is no justice. This is the only hope. Without this, what do we have? We just have injustices multiplying until everything ends. Only God can give true justice. I'd like to close with one quote and one exhortation to you. I think this is just too good of a summary to miss for this passage. One pastor said, This is man's last day in God's court. This day of judgment, this tribunal, this court, this trial will not be familiar to the trials held on earth. For those on trial this day will experience a very different kind of court. There will be no debate about guilt or innocence. There will be a prosecutor, but no defender. There will be an accuser, but no advocate. There will be an indictment, but no case for the charge. There will be swift presentation of a convincing evidence, but no rebuttal, a testimony with no cross-examination. There will be an utterly unsympathetic judge and no jury. There will be a sentence, but no appeal, a punishment with no parole, and a jail with no escape. The petty courts of earth fall far short of this one. Somewhere unknown to us between heaven and earth, between this world as we know it now and the new heaven and the new earth, this judgment will take place in the last courtroom that will ever convene throughout all eternity. After this, no one will ever be tried again, and God will never act as judge. That's what we're looking at here, final justice. There won't be a need for another court because it's all been dealt with. And we will go into eternity with God, dwelling with him, being his people. And so if you're here today and you are not in Christ, you just have seen what is awaiting you. You have just seen where you're headed. No escape, no way out, eternal torment for your sins forever. And so I beg you to be reconciled to God while it's still available. If you believe on Christ, he will have taken the punishment for sin that you deserve, and you can go into eternity where the effects of sin are undone and live with God forever. And those of us who are saved, a message like this and a passage like this should cause us to thank God every day for choosing us, for choosing to save us from the hell that we deserved and to see the value of Christ's death, and to see the saving purpose of his blood for all the beauty that it is. And when before the throne, for the throne, I stand in him complete, Christ died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. When we stand before the throne, we're not worried about what's written in the books, when we stand before the throne, we repeat that one thing, being complete in Christ, that he died my soul to save. That's why we rejoice as believers. When we read a passage like this, we rejoice because our name is written in the book of life, because we have been saved by the blood of Christ. And that's the only hope for you if you're here today, is to believe on Christ, that he took the punishment you deserve as a worthy substitute and made atonement for your sin. Don't wait another day to do that. If you're here today and you know you're not saved, talk to somebody here, believe on Christ, and be saved. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you didn't have to warn us about the judgment to come, but you chose to. That you did not have to reveal what was coming. You didn't have to reveal the standard of your law by which we'll be judged. You didn't have to send your son to be a substitute for us. You didn't have to make atonement for sin. You didn't have to choose us because we would never choose you. You didn't have to turn some of us from the judgment we deserve to make us trophies of your mercy in all eternity. You didn't have to pour out judgment. You didn't, you didn't have to create a new heaven and a new earth where we could reign with you. But you've done all these things to glorify yourself. And we thank you for that. We thank you for offering a sacrifice when we didn't deserve it, for choosing us when we would run from you and be enemies of you. We thank you for changing our hearts that hated you and allowing for us to be saved and to come to you. And I pray that the view of eternity would burn in our hearts, that we could see the seriousness of sin, 
that we would understand the pressing, urgent need to share the gospel with those who we know are headed into eternity, even though they may not know it themselves. I pray that you would convict us and give us the strength to do that in the face of awkward conversations and you know, potential persecution of being excluded from society or social groups, but that we would stand on your word and that we would look these doctrines that are sometimes hard for us to understand and hard for us to to understand the purpose behind them, but that we would stand squarely on your word and to look the truth in the face and to worship you because of it. And finally, one last time, we are so grateful that you made a way for us to be reconciled to you, though we deserve judgment. And I ask for the believers in the room that you would soften our hearts again to be thankful every day for that sacrifice, and for the unbelievers in the room, that you would renew their minds, renew their hearts, that they would see their need of you, and that they would come to you this morning. And we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. 